That's why I don't leave singing. I stay in my lane. Let's go, Court. And some of y'all said, good, stay in your lane. Well, good morning. Good morning. And happy Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like it's a national holiday today. Um, it's true. There is a petition that is going around right now, signed by thousands upon thousands of people, petitioning that the Super Bowl Sunday be made a national holiday. I mean, a football game. Some chicken wings. Well, a chicken wing park. That, 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 might, that might need a little, you know, a little honoring. Come on, Chip. We got some chicken wings today, right? But let me, let me share with you guys some other stuff about Super Bowl Sunday. As I said, it's petitioned to be a national holiday. Thousands upon thousands of signatures. 16 million people will call in sick tomorrow morning. Wow. On this day, people will spend some $14.1 billion on food, apparel, and decorations. Wow. 189 million people are expected to watch the Super Bowl today in this country. Now, that surpasses last year's total of 114 million people, and that was the largest televised watch uh, game event of any kind in the history of the United States. 60% of all the food that will be ordered for delivery or taken out will be pizza. 1.25, now catch this, 1.25 billion chicken wings will be eaten. And I'm going to get my share of them chicken wings later on today. Now, now, G got to let me have it. It's a holiday, honey. You see what's going on. I get some chicken wings today. Eight million pounds of guacamole will be eaten. Wow. Catch this one. 325 million gallons of beer will be drank. That's one gallon for every man, woman, and child in this country. Kids included. Those commercials that we like. Those commercials that we like. Those 30 second commercials. Each will cost $3.5 million every time you see it. Imagine the ones you see a few, th few times through the Super Bowl. And catch this. The price of a ticket. The price of a ticket to the Super Bowl will be between $2,150 and $6,750. I mean, these people have put some effort into the Super Bowl. They have really supersized the Super Bowl. Wouldn't it be awesome if Christians put in this kind of effort to have super faith as they do in the Super Bowl? We are a mixed up society and that is why our faith goes like this. We're not going to talk about any more of the Super Bowl today. Well, maybe a little analogy here and there. But today we're going to talk about super faith. Uh, we're going to be looking from the book of James here. I like the idea of using James because he don't play. He just kind of says things as it is. He challenges the mere talk and he either uh, validates your walk or not. But let's go to the book of James and jump in here. And let's, let's get busy with this sermon. I'm excited to give it to you. My faith today, looking at you, is on another level. Come on. Seeing what God is doing amongst you and through you, because of you, I'm excited. I'm excited for this great city, that it has Christians that are dedicated, committed to God, who have the faith 
that actually will move mountains. Yep. Yeah. Come with me and let's go to Jesus' brother James and see what he has to say about faith. Come on. In James chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 14, and we're going to learn three different kinds of faiths, because there are many, there are many kinds. There's the Super Bowl faith. We see that one, don't we? Yeah. We see that, but we're going to talk about three kinds of faith that matters most to us, or that we should be thinking about. The first type of faith is a dead faith. It is a dead faith. Let's go on James and read. McCoy. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. You know, James begins to teach us and talk to us of what dead faith looks like. He says these kinds of people or these people with this kind of faith, they know the correct vocabulary to use as Christians, don't they? or the correct vocabulary to use in prayer and doctrine. They can even quote a verse at the right time. You, you know, talk to a few people. Some going, they got a scripture. They can quote a verse from the Bible. But here's the challenge with that. Their walk does not measure up to their talk. See, it is only an intellectual kind of faith. It's a faith that is found only in the mind. In one's mind, you know the doctrine of salvation, but they have never really submitted themselves to the lordship of Jesus and made him lord of their life in every area of their life. They know the right words, but they do not back it up with their words and their works. They say, I believe, but I have no time to share the message of the cross and how it has changed my life to anyone. There's a difference in, you know, we invite somebody, we all do that, hey, come out to my church. Hey, come out and see my folks. But that's an invitation to church. That is not the sharing of faith. When we share faith, it is the same or synonymous with a witness, a testimony to have been a witness or to have a testimony about what you have seen or what has been done in you, through you, and for you. So many say I have faith, but yet have the inability to share that real faith with others. They say they believe, but won't challenge others to repent. I love you. I do not want you to go in the wrong place. But they will not challenge you to change for fear you will not like them anymore. So what that tells us, their faith is in the relationship, not in the power of God to change the life of their brother and sister. Well, that's not love. See, there's a, a myth about love and, and faith in and of itself that these are these feelings that you get. I feel, we're going to talk about this in a minute, but I feel faithful, so I'm faithful. That's not necessarily the case. I feel all lovey-dovey, but I'm doing acts of love that actually uh, kill someone in their spirit. I have an improper relationship with a woman, but I say I love her. Come on now. I say I love my family, but I hold things against them. You know, this dead kind of faith, it'll say I believe, but it will scoff that when sacrifice is called for. I believe in the word of God. I believe it's the saving grace for mankind. And I believe God has given it to us to deliver it to others. But we scoff when that sacrifice is called for 
in order to do it in Australia, in China, in Sao Paulo, Brazil, in Lagos, Nigeria, and on and on and on and on. Do we believe? Can this kind of faith save? The answer is an emphatic no. James emphasizes that faith without works is dead three times in this passage. Yeah. Now James is never short on, I mean, he, he goes right to the bullet. You know when someone says something to you three times, they really mean it. That's true, Come on. Come on. Right. My mom used to say to me, y'all have one of these mamas that tell you to do something? And then maybe you get a second one. But the third time, if she, you, you, you know, you're going to get something with to help you go and do it. My, my mom was like that. Now, she, used to, she used to try to help me out sometimes because she would count. Boy, one. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Some of y'all been like, one, two. But I, I knew she was going to wait to three, so I always wait until she almost got the three. Okay, and I'm gone before she can get it out of her mouth. But James here says it three times. That means it's serious. That faith without works is dead. That, that a declaration of faith, to say that I have faith and not have a changed life, yeah. is dead faith. And it's the kind of faith that is counterfeit and it lulls people into a false confidence of eternal life. I'm okay. I feel I'm okay. I feel it. You know, you know I feel it. I feel, I had a family member boy used to get drunk and say, everything is beautiful, I feel it. You know what it is, it's that drunk spirit, I feel it. Come on now. And you think you feel good until you wake with your hangover. Well, do any of us have this kind of faith? What we do if our walk does not measure up to our talk. We do if our works do not measure up to our words. Let it not be said we can do that. See, no man can come to Christ in faith and not be changed any more than someone could shoot you 100 times in your forehead and you not be changed. In John, 1 John chapter 5, it says, whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Real faith makes a difference. It's living. It's living. It's, it's, it's more than a feeling. Let me give you an example. Faith acts when you don't feel faithful. Come on, Corey. Come on. Come on, Corey. Come on. You come to a point where maybe this walk, this thing with God is too tough. Maybe things haven't gone exactly as you want them to go in your Christian walk. And of course, that can bring a lot of disillusionment, yes? But here's what faith is. When you walk right through it and you stay obedient and faithful to God in the purpose that he set forth for you. See, it's not, time, it's not until you can get challenged to see if you have faith that you don't even know that you have faith. Some of us are missing the opportunity for our faith because we're quitting at the first sign of trouble or we're unwilling to persevere until that faith is deep-rooted and you can see the victory and the power of God working in your life. You can't quit. Ever. A dead faith that is not accompanied by the works of God is dead. Now there's a second type of faith here. This one's scary to me. The first faith is a dead faith and it's, it's just an intellectual understanding. It's just in the mind. You know, and, and James, you know, I, I was trying to think of, uh, you know, different, how to make these points uh, maybe sound catchy, but I, I just figured I would go on along with, you know, how James said them. And so the first one he said is a what? A, a, a dead faith. I mean, you can't get, you, you know what dead is, don't you? If I say he dead, you go, oh, he dead. It's over. Gone. But the second kind of faith is, is similar. He talks about it here in verse 19, 18 and 19. But some of you will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith 
by my deeds. You believe that there is one God. Good. I can just see his face. Good, you believe. Good for you. Good. Even the demons believe that. And they, they shudder. They shudder. Many believe that, but are not moved. But the demons, they believe that, and they shudder. So this second kind of faith, I call it a demonic faith. Demonic faith. Come on, Corey. Now, perhaps to shock all of the complacent readers of the Bible, James reminds us that even demons have a kind of faith. And it ain't dead. They, they shudder. He's talking right here, he's not talking about atheists or agnostic people here, those that question the existence of God. Even the demons have a better faith. The demons' faith, let me show you it to you about the demons. The demons even believe in the deity of Christ. Mark chapter 3, verse 11. Whenever the impure spirits saw him, saw Jesus... They fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. Even they knew who he was. The demons believed in an existence of a place of condemnation or hell as we may name it. In Luke 8, in Luke 8 verse 31 it says, And they begged Jesus. Remember when, remember when the, he sent the lesions into the pigs. But before that, he was, they were fearful that he was going to do away with them. And the Bible says his, and that they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them into the abyss. There's a place. And they know it. And they believe Jesus will be the judge. Matthew 8, verses 28, 29. When he arrived on the, uh, in the region of Gardenius, two demon-possessed men coming from the tombs met him. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. <laughs> what do you want from us? What do you want from us? They shouted, and here it is. Have you come before the appointed time to torture us? They know that Jesus will be their judge. And yet, they don't obey. Now, we saw that the man with dead faith was touched only in his mind. The demons are touched not just in the mind of intelligence, but now in the heart of emotions. Note, the Bible says they believe and then they shudder. So their emotions are very evident. There are many who believe and they get emotional. But can this kind of faith save? You see, there's one step. This is a, only a step up above dead faith because it's involving both the mind and the heart. True saving faith involves something more. It involves something more, something that can be seen, something that can be recognized. It requires a changed life. Look what James says here in, in chapter 2. Let's go back to that, our text in verse 18. He says, some of you will say, well, you have faith, but I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. Amen. Now, I want to note here that he's not saying, this passage is not saying a faith that I can become this or that. Becoming the best at anything or, be, or becoming very successful by all of the world's standards does not mean you have faith the kind he's talking about. He says faith and works, fakes and deeds. Ephesians 2.8 says this, that, God, that we're saved by the grace of God. You know, this is not of yourself so that no man can boast. And we are saved to do the works that God has prepared in advance for us to do. So the work we're talking about right here is not the desires of our hearts, but the work of God. And then the scriptures say that he that, uh, you know, delight yourself in the work of God and he grant your desires of your heart. The works of God have always 
taken precedent. So show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds, by my, my changed life. You've heard the example over and over. I'd rather see an example than hear about one anyway. See, being a Christian involves lordship in Christ and living for Christ. Amen. See, first you receive your salvation. You receive the spirit of God through the waters of baptism. And then you reveal the changed life yeah. to everyone else. Yeah. Come on. Do we have this kind of faith? We do, if we just believe the right things and feel the right things, the demonic faith, if that's all we do. We do if our service to God doesn't go beyond understanding and emotions. We do if we think just knowing the right doctrine makes us saved. Emotional experiences does not constitute faith. Right. Not a saving faith anyway. Come on, bro. I, I, I remember, you know, I studied the Bible with a lot of people. Um, and, I, I, and I ran across a, a gentleman one time, and I was trying to share with him the truth of salvation, the way the Bible teaches it. Yeah. And he said, but I had experience, and I know I'm saved. Come on, bro. But, well, how do you know? How do you know? How do you know? Where, where, where do you get that? I had an experience. I know I'm saved. So the Bible doesn't teach us salvation by experiences. It teaches us that we must come in contact with the blood of Jesus. Yep. Romans 6, 1 through 4 says, Shall we continue sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. Or don't you know that those who have been baptized in Jesus Christ, just as he was raised from the dead, are raised to a new life. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. So it's there that we encounter Amen. the covering, salvation giving blood yep. of Jesus Christ. That's right. According to scripture. Amen. But I feel it. But I'm not more loving than I was. <laughs> yeah. Come on. I feel it. But I still got something against someone. Come on, Corey. I feel it. But I still doubt that God will meet all my needs. Yeah. Oh, I feel it. But I just can't obey it. Can this kind of faith save? No. So, there's a dead faith that cannot save. There's a demonic faith that we feel saved but cannot save. So what is there left? There's a saving faith called super faith. Called super faith. Called su let's read on a little more. I like this. This is where you get happy. And I'm praying you got super faith this morning. I'm praying you got super faith. Look in James. Let's go back to it. Chapter 2. Let's pick up in verse 20. It says, you foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions, check it out now, were working together. Yeah. Come on now. And his faith was made complete, not by what he felt, by what he did. Oh, come on now. Y'all think I'm making this up. <laughs> now, verse 33. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was accredited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. Amen. Wouldn't you like to be called God's friend? Oh, yeah. You know, you know, you know, you're in a room and, and they come in and they go, hey, there go God's friend over there. They go God's friend. Wouldn't you like to be that person they're talking about? Yeah, I'm, me and God, we boys, you know. Me and God, yeah, we're going to watch Super Bowl together today. Me and, eat some chicken wings. You know, we're going to do that. Me and God, me and God tight. God's friend. Why? Because he did not just believe in God, but he obeyed God. Most people's faith is, are, is delinquent because they don't have the obedient factor backing up what they say they believe. 
You cannot claim the power of God and walk in darkness. You can't walk like a demon and think you're an angel. You cannot say I'm a saint while you build the building blocks of hell. Come on. But he was a friend of God because he did what God called him to be. He says in verse 4, you see, that person is considered righteous by what they do and not faith alone. Now this passage, when it's used, it's making it very clear that you can't say, I believe and it's over, it's done. In the same way, was not Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. That's right. Come on, bro. Now, what kind of faith is this? What kind of faith is this, this super faith? Well, number one, it's based on the word of God. Romans 10, 17. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word about Christ. It's built in the word of God. You see, super faith involves the whole person. You want to have super faith? You can't just bring your mind. You can't just bring your heart. Super faith involves the whole person. Look what Jesus says in Luke when he says what it takes to be my disciple. He says, unless you give up everything, you cannot be my disciple. He holds nothing back. Everything you want, everything? Everything? Well, y'all know what I'm saying. Everything means everything. Yeah. Super faith involves a whole person. Dead faith is just the mind. Demonic faith is the mind and emotion. Super faith involves the mind, the emotion, and the will. You see, the mind understands truth. The heart desires and rejoices in the truth. But the will of man surrendered to God will act upon the truth. True saving faith then must lead to action. Must lead to action. It is not emotionalism. Come on, Corey. It is that which leads to obedience in the good works that God has set before us. Well, let's look at it this way. James gives two examples here of Abraham and Rahab. You couldn't find two more different people. Abraham was the father of the Jews. Rahab was a Gentile. Abraham was a godly man. Rahab had been a sinful woman, a prostitute. Abraham was a friend of God, the scriptures tell us. Rahab had belonged to the enemies of God. What do they have in common? On the outside looking in, nothing. But when we look at putting faith into action, they both exercise a saving faith in God. Abraham demonstrated his faith by his works. He was willing to sacrifice his son Isaac. He previously was told to go not knowing where he was going, and he went. Rahab went against her own people and hid the spies and then sent them in the opposite direction of those that were coming to kill them. So perfect faith, I can't even say it, perfect faith involves your mind, your heart, and your will. It is important for us today that each of us as professing Christians examine his or her own heart and life and make sure that we possess true saving faith, which I call a super faith. Here are some questions that we can ask ourselves. Was there a time when 
honestly, you realize that you're a sinner and admit it to yourself and to God. I am a sinner. I'm a sinner. I've done so many funerals in the last few months. And on uh, Friday, I, I buried my uncle. I did his funeral this past Friday. And in the room as I gave the eulogy, and I watched all of my family members and friends that were his. Some of the guys who helped, you know, mentor me, if you will. I saw my old basketball coach, won my first championship with. But I saw all my family, and many of us hadn't seen each other for 30, 20 and 30 years. Wow. Now through the years, that I had contact a little bit here and there. Usually somebody was asking me for some money. But when I looked in the room, I was broken because aside from that type of communication, I had not given my heart to them. I had not shared the faith to all of them. Now some of them had been Christians and fallen away. But there was a room, a sea of people that I, over the years, it was almost like out of sight, out of mind. And I looked at them. And I was broken hearted. So I have sinned against my family. I have sinned. I have a saving faith. And I have not shared it with them. Come on, bro. I had friends in there. They were mentors of mine that helped me get to where I got to in my life. And I did not share a saving faith. And it broke me. I ask you. Have you shared yours? Have you admitted your sin to God? Was there a time when your sin stirred you in a way that I just I gotta leave this sin? Right. Yeah. Come on. I cannot continue this way. I don't want the separation of me and God. And I don't want to harm anyone else. Amen. Do you truly understand the gospel? That Jesus died for your sins. And yes, he rose, but just as he lived again, you too can live a new life. Amen. Have I really repented? It is. Come on. Am I living under the lordship of Jesus? Amen. Have I been baptized for the forgiveness of my sin? Do, do I really desire to share Christ? Or am I ashamed of him? Is the task some responsibility that's a mandate? on me or do I take personal responsibility Amen. <laughs> do I enjoy the fellowship of God's people is worship a delight to me or do I secretly hang in the world and enjoy it am I ready for the Lord's return am I ready You see, we live in a world, in a country, and it's all over the world in many places where we as Christians profess faith, but it's not life-giving salvation faith until we walk the walk. For us in the Chicago International Church, and those of you that are here visiting with us, I hope you will see a difference and you'll want to be part of that. Amen. We mean to change the city. We're not perfect individuals. In fact, I'm the leader of the messed up ones. <laughs> but I have a saving faith. I know it's by grace that I'm here. And I use every inch of it to live and have victory. Don't let your faith be dead. Come on. Come on. Don't be fooled into a demonic one that says, I feel okay. But have super faith. Give your heart, mind, and soul to the only one that can save. Search yourself Amen. and make that decision. I leave you with this prayer from the Psalms that I use, that I play in my head every night before I go to bed. Psalms 139, verses 23 and 24. And it simply says, search me. O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me. And lead me 
in the way of everlasting. I want you to have super faith. Watch the Super Bowl with super faith. Eat your chicken wings with super faith. Eat your guacamole with super faith. But whatever you do, you do it with super faith in God. Amen. God bless you.